Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I apologize for the delay, but welcome to the second in the series of uh, politicians and professionals in which we have the five party leaders to speak to us. And the David Hume Institute is, as usual, very grateful to the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and the Law Society of Scotland for their support in this. Um, the eagle eyes of you will have noticed that on the programme, we have the date 13th of January 2015. Um, Ruth was late, but she wasn't eight days late. Uh, I'm afraid that is our error. But everything else in there is uh, factually correct, I hope. Um, I'm not going to speak for any longer. I'm going to hand over now to Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. And after that, Dame Joan Stringer, who is a trustee of the David Hume Institute, will chair the discussion. So, Ruth, over to you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you uh, this evening. It is a pleasure to be here again. I did speak uh, about a year ago, uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the intervening year uh, has been a, a challenging, a stretching, and inspiring one to a degree that was perhaps impossible to predict at its outset. Uh, on both sides of last year's referendum debate, we've had our arguments, our metal, and our stamina tested uh, to the maximum. But I think the last year was also a strain on the, the country's social fabric as well. Um, politicians and the general public, I think, quite rightly celebrated the way in which uh, everybody across Scotland engaged in democracy, uh, particularly uh, the voting was at an unprecedented level. But I think we must recognise too that the debate itself divided families, uh, friendships and colleagues, and that in many cases those divisions continued beyond the 18th of September, and some of them still continue, uh, and that, I believe, is as unhelpful as it is unhealthy. It meant then, and it means now, that more than ever we need organisations which dispassionately and rationally added and add their own thoughts and information to the debate, so as, better, as, so as to better our understanding, not just of the issues, but for our fellow Scots for, with whom we might disagree. The David Hume Institute does exactly that job, and for that I speak for many in saying that we are grateful to you. Now, the subject that I've been asked to speak about tonight is which sort of Scotland do we wish to create? And I, I want to answer that question by offering, it won't surprise you to learn, a conservative vision for Scotland a Conservative vision for all of Scotland. Now, it suits politicians, it's always suited politicians and parties of many stripes to characterise their opponents as representatives only of their own vested interests. Indeed, that's a charge that's been levelled at my party, the Scottish Conservatives, more than once by those who wish to increase their vote share at our expense. But it is a charge that I'm going to wholeheartedly reject, because as a young woman growing up in Fife, shaping my views at Buckhaven High School, the first generation of my family to go to university, paying my own way in life and taking nothing that wasn't earned. I know that the Conservative vision is a vision for all Scots, a vision that's rooted in values which have served this country well for centuries. Those are, values are hard work, ambition, responsibility and just reward. A belief that in rewarding hard work, we build a nation which helps people get on in life. A belief in personal responsibility, in strong but limited government, and in individual freedom. A belief that government and civil society is there to provide people with the tools to help them better themselves, but also to deal justly and firmly with those who would take advantage. These are our values, and I believe that they are Scotland's values too. And this evening I hope that I can demonstrate how the Scottish Conservatives now occupy the centre ground in Scottish politics. And I want to show you a real alternative to the, to the left and to the even further left that we are seeing now. Uh, so I propose a, a more prosperous, a more ambitious, and yes, a fairer Scotland, which is a Conservative Scotland. Now, 
A few months ago, uh, in October, just after the referendum, at the Conservative Party conference down south, I joked that finally I would no longer have to make speeches about the constitution and the referendum. Sadly, uh, as a certain creed of our opponents have had great difficulty in accepting the result, that has proved to be slightly more difficult than I'd hoped. Although you'll be glad to hear that it's not my intention this evening to pick over the pieces from last year for too long. But as I make my case this evening for a Conservative Scotland, I must quickly go over three key moments from those extraordinary few months that we all experienced, because I believe they make my case for me. The first was in early June, when our party published our plans for further devolution. There were many sceptics within the SNP, within Labour, within the Chatterati, who assumed that the Conservatives would not deliver. They repeated a stereotype of a Conservative Party resistant to change, but they were rudely awoken, I believe, by the Strathclyde Commission. It is no exaggeration to say that it was seen as the most coherent and influential report on devolution of the last five years. And that was for one big reason. We didn't try and buy off any internal party interests as Labour did. We simply applied our values to the issue before us. Responsibility and accountability were hardwired into everything that we did. So our commission, which included sceptics at the start of the process, could not justify a parliament which didn't look taxpayers in the eye before taking and spending their money. So our plans were radical and I believe influential in shaping the referendum campaign. And it was a moment when Scots saw us demonstrate how conservative thinking could improve Scotland's democracy. The second moment was, not surprisingly, the result itself. There may have been a crossover poll a fortnight before, but the margin itself of 10 points plus was decisive and unambiguous. Now, I know that Alex Salmon broke the first rule of politics by trying to claim that two million people who voted no were duped and didn't know what they were voting for, and it suggested that he didn't think much of their intelligence. But I don't believe that electorates are wrong. I don't believe they're ever wrong, because that's not how democracy works. And the Scottish people are not now, nor have they ever been, the plaything of any particular party or movement. They spoke loud and they spoke clear. And an undisputable majority saw exactly what lay behind the choice on offer. And they decided to maintain a union which works for all of us, but was itself prepared to change. It was, I believe, a hard-headed decision based on a firm grasp of the arguments. And when one side of those arguments pitch an offer that seems too good to be true, a bid based on fantasy economics, people can smell it a mile off. So that was the second one. The third moment, I believe, was the Smith Agreement just a month later. In June on Carlton Hill, in August on Buchanan Street, and at the start of September um, opposite Holyrood, I joined with the leaders of the Scottish Labour Party and with your speaker last week, Willie Rennie, the leader of the Scottish Democrat Party, pledging to deliver more powers for a Scottish Parliament. Following the result, the SNP and Greens were invited into that process too, to write a new agreement on where power should lie. Tomorrow, we will see that agreement start on the road to realisation, with the Prime Minister in Edinburgh publishing the legislation which will make it happen. Those draft clauses make good the commitment that we gave to the people of Scotland before the referendum to deliver a more powerful a more responsible Scottish Parliament as soon as practically possible. A vow honoured in full. And our party has again played its full part in that process. As has been widely noted, the Smith Agreement is framed by and is closest to the Strathclyde Commission recommendations. It is a Conservative plan for Scotland and one I believe will make this country a better place. I believe the role in framing these developments, as well as in the fighting of the campaign, has demonstrated that our party is more relevant in Scotland today than at any point in the last generation. So three big moments which, for me, tell a story of a Conservative party, true to its values, proposing and delivering a plan for a stronger union. And of a Scotland which heard that message and which backed it. So on the Constitution, I think we're back at the very centre of the political debate, back where we belong shaping and directing the future of this country. 
But I don't believe in patting politicians on the back, and even less in the rather unedifying spectacle of them doing it themselves. So rather, we have to ask ourselves what's next. And before I answer that, let me say one thing about our nationalist opponents. Before the referendum, we were repeatedly told that this was a once-in-a-lifetime event, that they wanted to concentrate the minds of wavering yes voters to push them over the edge. That was a fraudulent pledge at the time it was made, and so it has been proved. Only last week, the former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, was once again talking up the prospect of another referendum very soon. This needs to stop. Not out of triumphalism, or of fear, or a wish to ram defeat down others' throats, but because continuing the uncertainty over Scotland's future damages the precious confidence that we need potential investors in our country to maintain. A responsible Scottish National Party, a responsible Scottish government, would seek to end this uncertainty by sticking to their word. Without that pledge, Nicola Sturgeon will become our Groundhog Day First Minister, reliving the referendum over and over again and trapping the rest of the country with her. Enterprise thrives on confidence and it withers with uncertainty and it's time, after the last few years of flux, that we gave them the stability they yearn. And while we ask the SNP to confirm that they're not going back, we in the Conservative Party are looking forward because I believe there are new battles to be fought, a more fruitful political debate to be had than redrawing the battle line between nationalist and unionist. Low taxes and empowered individuals against a grasping and greedy bureaucracy. Limited government versus strangling state intervention. Local democracy against central diktat. Just as last year showed that Conservatives were in tune with the majority of Scots in the referendum, so I believe these contests will show we represent their values too. And here's the evidence. On tax and spend, the SNP Labour consensus would have us believe that Scots are champing at the bit to pay more tax. They claim that Scots want the money to fund more welfare payments. It is a myth. A Servation poll at the weekend found only 7% of Scots want income tax increased, and far more said they wanted Holyrood to cut the cost of benefits against those who wanted it to spend more. And that's exactly where we stand. We support a cap on benefits to ensure that people know that work always pays. In return, we will, as the Prime Minister said earlier this week, meet our side of the bargain by pushing for a nation with full employment so that everyone who needs a job can get one. And we will always be on the side of cutting taxes, not as a political tactic, because we believe it's the right thing to do. We believe that individuals should be able to keep more of the money they earn and that businesses should be able to reinvest in our economy in the way that best works for them. And I believe that message is exactly what most Scots want to hear. If we just look at events in the Scottish Parliament in recent weeks, in October, John Swinney announced an eye-watering new rate of stamp duty for Scots. The value of homes over £250,000 would be charged a whacking great 10% rate. Many people moving up the property ladder would be stung for thousands of pounds of extra tax. We in the Conservative Party made our case for a rethink. We showed how a tax cut could be fully funded thanks to changes to the Scottish Block Grant. And the Chancellor then made the case for a cut irresistible by himself reducing stamp duty rates across the UK. The SNP has, as a result today, said that it will now review that plan. And there are two points here. Without a Conservative-led government in Westminster, and without an energetic Conservative party in Scotland, John Swinney's original plans would be going through from April the 1st this year. And I don't believe for a second that a UK government led by Ed Miliband would have cut stamp duty across the UK by £800 million. Secondly, and possibly more importantly than that, that plan would have been pushed through against the wishes of most Scots. I simply don't believe that the majority support the original SNP plan to hike up the tax on aspiration. And it gives me confidence, because the stamp duty changes and the issue and the new land and buildings transaction tax is only the foretaste of more to come. 
more taxes will soon be devolved to go with it. And I wager that when rates and bans are unveiled, that it will be the Conservative Party who will represent majority of Scottish opinion by backing a low-tax Scotland. That poll at the weekend showed just 7% of people wanting higher income taxes. And even with a margin for error, that means 90% think they're either paying too much or at least enough. Like two bald men fighting over a comb, if Labour and the SNP want to argue the right to pay higher taxes, then I say they're more than welcome to it. But it's not just tax, though. It's elsewhere, too, because if we look at the challenges that are facing Scotland in the coming years, we have an ageing population, more financial constraints that will place ever more pressure on our public services. At the same time, we'll need to rethink our tax system, both because of the new taxes coming our way and because, in the case of council tax, the status quo is well past its sell-by date. Yet the SNP Labour consensus has so far been to turn a bit of a blind eye. Labour commissioned a report on public sector reform by Arthur Midwinter two years ago and have now buried it. Not to be outdone, the SNP received two reports on public sector reform, one by Crawford Beveridge and one by the late Campbell Christie. Again, we've largely seen their work shelved. I'm determined not to follow that path. Ahead of the 2016 Hollywood election, all political parties in Scotland must start producing answers to some pretty tough questions. And we want to meet that ha challenge head on. We all know that the way the Scottish Government operates will change radically. It will have both to balance the books and look taxpayers in the eye as it does so. It will have more responsibility to grow the economy, to create jobs and profits, which in turn pay for our schools and hospitals. But if its policies stunt growth, if it destroys jobs, then the cash flow will dry up. It is a big change. It's a change for which we need to be prepared. So in the coming days, we're going to lay out our plans to set up an independent commission on tax, competitive, tax competitiveness. We will look at all current and future taxes coming under the Scottish Government's control. It will run the rule over Scotland's cluttered public sector. In time for next year's Holyrood elections, it will report back with recommendations on how Scotland's new tax and spending system can best be used to boost economic growth. Independent of the party, the Commission will have free reign to make recommendations as it sees fit. And all I hope is that just as we led the way last year with proposals in the devolution of power, so we will lead the way in showing how those powers should be used. And of course it's right that the handover of these powers will occupy much attention starting tomorrow. But for me it's time we focused as much on what powers should be devolved within Scotland as those that are coming to it. Because the truth is, local democracy in Scotland is now in a state of peril. While the power game between Holyrood and Westminster is played out every week with monotonous bus stops, the Scottish local democracy is forced to sit in the stairs, a mere observer to this marital spat. Now, it's not often you will hear a Conservative Party leader quote the hard-left Jimmy Reid Foundation, but on this occasion, please let me give them a glowing reference, and I'm sure they'll be delighted with me for doing so. Um, two years ago, the Foundation wrote a report on local democracy in Scotland, and its main point deserves repeating. Below the national level, below Holyrood, its report pointed out that Scotland was, and I'll quote directly, the least democratic country in the European Union. The least democratic country in the EU. We have a tiny cadre of professional politicians that are separate from society running the country, they said. They were helped to add it by professional managers who made decisions about our communities with little reference to the people who lived there. And on this point, if on few others, I agree with the Jimmy Reid Foundation. I don't believe anyone can now dispute that power has been centralised to Edinburgh by the SNP. Decisions on whether your local police station stays open are being made by central command. It doesn't matter how well your child is performing at school. It doesn't matter if your local authority wants to concentrate resource on needy families. Government diktat says that your child must have a state-imposed guardian. Even the question of rural land ownership should be ruled over by bureaucrats sitting in Edinburgh 
with a direct right to intervene and call in. And all of this was capped off last week when Alex Salmon's former aide and the SNP MSP, Joe McAlpine, used her daily record column to declare that people who promoted more devolution within Scotland did so, and again, I'm going to quote this directly because it's, it's special, to bring down our parliament. So maybe these slightly stunning and stupid comments last week were the sort of moment that we hit peak nat. Because in Joan McAlpine's world, it appears that it is now anti-Scottish to believe that local decisions should be taken locally wherever possible and practical. I think that's a, a view that's as bizarre as it is sinister. And the Conservative case is that this status mentality and the, the power grab that we've seen in the last seven years needs to end. Scotland's services are some of the most centralised in the developed world, and, and I don't believe it can continue. Because I believe that a central belt bureaucracy is squeezing the life out of the rest of the country, and the rest of Scotland now wants its say. Scotland can't and shouldn't be run from the M8 corridor. And we will campaign this year to ensure that power spreads right across the nation, because central to our thinking is that power should always be devolved away from governments and parliaments and to people and communities. We don't want the ownership of affordable housing dictated in Edinburgh or London. We want people to have the right to buy their own council home. We don't want union barons to decide on a whim how their members view a particular issue. We want individual trade union members to have their say. And so it follows that we don't want Whitehall or St Andrew's House to dictate how every community runs its own affairs. We believe decisions should always be passed down to the lowest possible rung on the ladder. And for us, the first rung of that ladder is not a council. It's an individual. And we have an opportunity to start doing that now. Because the referendum, while important, sucked all of the oxygen out of the debating chamber. It prevented reform in other areas. And Scotland needs to refocus. In today's society, we have all of the information we could ever need at the touch of a smartphone. And a centralised top-down system of government is completely anachronistic. So power should go straight from national governments to our cities. The recent city deal between Glasgow and the UK government was a fantastic example of how we can do that. One billion pounds of funding from the UK and Scottish governments with borrowing from Glasgow and neighbouring councils, funding transport and employment programmes which should boost the local economy by £2.4 billion each and every year. But decisions taken in Glasgow on how to make that work. And that should just be the beginning. Because Edinburgh too wants to follow suit. And there's no reason for me why Aberdeen or Dundee shouldn't do so either. With new powers over the work programme, new powers over welfare being devolved to the Scottish Parliament, there are even more levers that the Scottish Government can offer local authorities to pull for themselves. But I don't believe it should stop there. Power should go from our cities and our regions to our local communities. It's still the case that in Scotland, only local authorities are in charge of our state schools. That despite the fact that many parents and communities would like to take on that responsibility. And I don't believe that their ambitions should be stymied. Why is the Scottish Government arrogant enough to suggest that there is only one way of doing things? That there is nothing that our country can learn from the technical schools of Japan, or the free schools of Sweden, or the charter schools of Canada? Why, when it comes to the learning of our children, is choice, freedom and diversity sacrificed on the altar of one size fits all with no change permitted. And I believe that empowerment is an issue which goes straight into your home. If you take the internet, you can't work in the modern world if you're not connected to it, which is why the Conservatives are rolling out super fast broadband right across the country, even in the most remote regions of Scotland where a phone line used to be tricky to get put in. They'll soon be enjoying bandwidth comparable with major urban centres. Being able to conduct business, no matter where you live, no penalty in time delay or download speeds, is what I call a real devolution of power. And it's as traditional a Conservative policy as could be imagined. Because our principle as Conservatives is not just to do things for people, but to put them in a position to do things for themselves. 
That's a quote from John Buchan in the 1920s, and he might as well have been saying it in reference to the broadband rollout in the 2020s. And this, I believe, all offers a genuine alternative. Unlike nationalism, it's an alternative which sees Scotland prospering as part of a United Kingdom, with a Scottish Parliament that uses greater power wisely to lower the financial burdens on people and to spread that power as widely as possible throughout the country. And I think that there are a number of reasons for this. Number one, it's an alternative that doesn't see endless conflict between London and Edinburgh, but sees collaboration. And I believe that's what people want. Over Christmas, we saw both our governments react superbly as we sought to find the best treatment possible for the first person diagnosed with Ebola in the U on UK soil. I thought the way both Nicola Sturgeon and the UK government handled the matter was exemplary. My only wish is such mutual respect would more often replace the false grievance that we see all too frequently. We have great minds in both our governments. Let's see them working together a bit more often. Number two, it's an alternative to an over-fussy and interfering state. It's a belief that personal responsibility should be at the heart of policy making. So parents are free to raise their children without a state-appointed guardian being forced upon them. So football fans are subject to the same laws as everybody else, not the dog's dinner of failed sectarian behaviour legislation. So parents can pick a school for their child and have different types of school from which to choose. Number three, it's an alternative to our sclerotic public sector system. It's about welcoming change and innovation, not treating it as a threat. And freeing schools from central control is pretty much near the top of that list for me. Number four, it's an alternative to centralising Scotland. It's a plan which seeks to push power back out of Edinburgh. Taking one example, the way in which the single police force has been rolled out urgently needs reform. Simply trying to stamp the rest of the country with a Strathclyde mould and expecting it to fit isn't working. Local communities need to feel that they've got their community police force back. Number five, it's an alternative which faces up to where we are, which accepts that in straitened times, the money tree can't pay for everything all of the time. In another poll, again just last week, we were shown that nearly half of Scots would be happy to pay prescription charges to help the NHS. I agree. And we are the only party in Scotland which supports the return of the charge for those who can afford to pay, and with the proceeds of that charge, directly funding a thousand extra nurses and midwives. And finally, number six. My hope is that this Scottish Conservative alternative can be seen as an option which is for everyone in Scotland, not just the few. The bitter irony of the last seven years is that while it has spoken, the SNP have spoken the language of social justice, it has favoured the privileged at the expense of the rest middle-class freebies and colleges cut in favour of universities. Meanwhile, they like to paint people like us on the right, people like me on the right, as enemies of society. And that's not the conservatism that I recognise. The conservative Scotland that I envisage offers a ladder of opportunity to all, not just the few. It believes that you should value vocational education just as highly as an academic one. It believes that we shouldn't decimate our college places just because we have a shibboleth etched in stone which insists that all university places should be free. And it supports tax cutting and a smaller state, not because we want to keep more money just for those who are already at the top of the ladder, but because the lower paid need to keep more of the money they earn. It calls for those things because we know that's how you create a successful economy, without which the services we need and require would suffer greatly. Cutting the deficit isn't just about cutting spending. It's about growing the economy too. And it's the only way we can rebuild a country which lives within its means. The only way, in other words, that we can keep better hospitals, stronger schools, and a secure justice system. There is nothing just, nothing just at all, about dumping our debts on our children and on kicking the can down the road. And I'm proud of that principle. And as we approach the general election in May, I'll be basing our campaign on the fruits, fruits that it has borne. Here in Scotland, 170,000 extra jobs. Across the UK, 1.75 million back in work. It didn't happen by accident. Thanks to the employment allowance, thanks to the cut in national insurance contributions, every business is at least £2,000 better off. Low jobs taxes, 
the stability of our fiscal plans. This is what gives businesses the confidence to hire, and it's given more people the dignity of a job. So I'm looking forward to standing on the record of a government which has reduced the number of people out of work and claiming benefits by 880,000 since 2010. Welfare reform has been tough and it's been controversial. But the welfare cap, set at £26,000, has sent a clear message that nobody should receive more in benefits than the average person earns in work. And it's a message that resonates. The benefits cap enjoys majority in Scotland support in Scotland that is far in excess of that south of the border. And I'm more than happy to back a government which has cut income tax for more than 26 million people and which, if we are re-elected, will raise the personal allowance further to £12,500. These are achievements that have been made against a headwind and which I believe will see us re-elected in May. In Scotland, I don't need to be reminded that the headwind can sometimes be pretty strong. <laughs> but my belief is that the corner has been turned. The principles that have guided us, that have guided our party, haven't changed. A belief in individual choice, a belief in responsibility, a belief in localism, a belief in low taxation and strong but limited government. But what has changed is that Scottish families can now see for sure that we are on their side. So the Scotland I want to build is a Conservative Scotland. I've always wanted that. What's changed is how much closer it has become to reach. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ruth. I think that um, we've heard a very cogent um, setting out of your vision for a Conservative Scotland. Um, and within that, I'm sure there is a great deal to discuss and debate. I'm sure there'll be many questions from the audience. So um, I'm going to go straight on. And could I just ask, when you ask your question to, first of all, perhaps give your name, uh, let us know who you are. But also, if you can keep the questions pretty sharp and direct, and I think I'll try to take two or three uh, at a time so that we can come back with um, a fairly uh, reflective uh, response on my left. So, the first one over here, please. Uh, Chris Lewin, um, I'd like to invite you to say something about how you would exercise the new income tax powers. Excuse me, sorry. Can, can you hear at the back? We've got a roving mic sorry. now, so that's... Chris Lewin, yeah. uh, I'd like to invite you to say something about how you would exercise the new income tax powers if you were uh, a Chancellor in the Scottish Government. Uh, in particular, uh, how would you uh, see... How much scope would you see between what the Scottish rates of interest, uh, of income tax were, and the rest of the UK rates. Okay, thank you. Over here. Hello, uh, Sarah Martin, Scottish Government. Um, I, you've outlined uh, that you'd like to see a strong but limited government, um, and you've outlined the limited aspects quite clearly. I was wondering where the strengths lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we deal with those two? Then, sure. Um, uh, first of all, taking the first one, uh, first, um, I would be looking to reduce uh, the tax burden over the course of the next Parliament, uh, if I could, by a penny in the pound. Um, I think we've seen in government underspends that have been well reported uh, that there there is scope there in, in some ways. Uh, but the reason that I'm setting up the... The, the tax commission that I'm doing is that we're about to have a whole basket of taxes related. Yes, uh, we're going to have uh, the wholesale devolution of income, tan uh, income tax bans and rates with all of the monies raised going directly to the Scottish Parliament, not going to Westminster and being transferred up as part of the block grant. But we're also seeing uh, business uh, issues. So we're seeing uh, VAT assignments, we're seeing environmental taxes, we're seeing land taxes, we're seeing a whole basket of areas and levers. Uh, and I want to look at the ways in which we can make our country the most dynamic in Northern Europe. 
And I think that we should be aspiring to that as a, a country of, of six million people that has some of the best small businesses in the world, some fantastic work going on with, with uh, organisations like Entrepreneurial Spark. Uh, I think we can be fleet-footed and dynamic. And I think that because of the devolution of, of some areas of, of taxes and of, uh, of others, we will find ourselves more in competition within the UK, which we haven't had before. And I want to make sure that, that we are at the forefront of that. In terms of strong but limited government, I mean, there are strengths that governments uh, have that individuals, groups and small communities don't. They're quite self-evident. So you look, for example, in the uh, defence sector, you know, I, I want to make sure that we have a strong defence force. As somebody who has uh, previously been uh, a member in a very small way and a small cog in, the, in that wheel during my own time in service, you know, I want to make sure that the UK government, as a provider of that, uh, is working at the highest level to ensure that we have the best kit for our people, the right number of people. We've re-rolled in the right ways so that we're no longer fighting the wars of the past but equipped to fight the wars of the future. But I think there are any number of ways you can do that. I think you can have uh, a strong government in terms of how it competes and how it sets the macro economy up to compete uh, on an international stage. I think there are ways in which governments can demonstrate their strength that works for individuals, for companies, uh, works within our place in the world that doesn't necessarily impinge on individual freedoms. Uh, in terms of, of the limitations, you're right, there are some ways in which I would like to limit the current government um, that we have at the UK level and the Scottish level, and, and uh, ways in which I don't want uh, further limitations to be put on it. And I think I gave several uh, examples. For, for me, the, the clear and, and present one that is most pressing is the idea that every single child in this country, whether their families want them to or not, whether they want to or not, will be given a named person to be a state guardian for them. I think that is an interference in, the, in family life in this country too far and that is a limit that I would want to see. So I think that you can um, have governments that demonstrate strength on a national stage but also ones where um, they've gone beyond where I would like the limit to be. Okay. Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Pete. Uh, Ruth, I see that Jim Murphy has now propose that there should be a Scottish Office of Budget Responsibility akin to that at the UK level. Uh, do you agree with me that something along those lines is absolutely essential in the, way to, in the light of the further devolution of tax and other matters following Smith and its implementation and that the existing fiscal commission is wholly inadequate? And ben. Uh, ben Thompson, Reform. Um, Ruth, very much welcome your comments on um, pushing powers down to uh, local government and, and closer to the individual. Would you also now envisage pushing tax and welfare powers down to a local level, uh, removing the cap off council tax, uh, returning business rates to local government, um, things like housing benefit, which are to do with local issues, returning that to uh, local government? Um, just interested in your views on that. Sure. Um, Jeremy, in answer to your point about uh, do I want to see a Scottish OBR, um, yes I do, that's why it was in our Strathclyde report that was published last June, um, and similar to drinking at football and a thousand extra nurses, it's another set of Conservative clothes that the new Labour leader has chosen to don in the last few months, it's becoming a bit of a habit. Um, in terms of Ben, in, in terms of looking to, to push powers out, I think some of the, the examples that you cite uh, are very different, but yes I want to see movement um, within uh, business rates, we've seen business and incentivisation schemes, I think that can go much further when it comes to the rates. Uh, I think in terms of some of the welfare changes that are coming through Smith, uh, the wholesale devolution of the work programme, uh, I think that can be pushed down to a local government level. Um, and sorry, you raised uh, one more as well. I, I, didn't, I didn't have time to write it down before I started answering Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think with council tax, there's, there's an issue there. I, I think that the model for council tax has probably gone beyond its usefulness, and we need to look at another way. Now, uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, a service charge, whether that is a, um, a, a local income tax, whether it's a hybrid of the two. That's one of the areas that I've put very strongly in the remit of the Tax Commission, because I think we need new uh, thinking on this. Um, I know that uh, other parties within the Scottish Parliament are doing the same. 
Uh, partly for political reasons, nobody wants to say we're going to immediately whack your council tax up, um, but partly because there is a question too uh, about the ability of local authorities um, when they've had such a, a straitjacket put straight jackets the wrong word, but you know what I mean, such a, a framework put upon them of the council tax freeze, they found it very difficult uh, to um, operate with the flexibility that they had previously, and that's been to the detriment of some local authorities in some areas. So uh, I want to see a, a review of the council tax and would support that. Okay, thank you. Ray, I think you wanted to pick up um, something. Ray Perman from the David Hume Institute. Uh, Ruth, with the new tax powers and other powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, do you think that the Parliament is equipped to scrutinise the use of those new powers and any new legislation around them, or does it need reform? Uh, I think it does. I mean, I think, um, I think there are issues uh, around a unicameral chamber where the oversight was supposed to have been directed and supplied by the committee system, and that that committee system, I, I think, has been demonstrated in the, the last couple of years, particularly under majority government, to um, need improvements. If that sort of pre- and post-legislative scrutiny, if that's the, the mechanism by which we do it, then I think we have to find some way in which it can become more effective and less partisan. There are a number of proposals that have been put out there by colleagues, by people within uh, the um, presiding officers uh, side of things, within the individual political parties themselves, particularly looking at, instead of having appointments by parties to who sits on what committee and, and, and the numbers, looking at having elections at in the similar way to the Westminster system, having financial um, recompense for, uh, for the chairman of committees so that they act um, more independently of the parties in which they serve. Uh, I think that's definitely an area that needs to be looked at. Uh, I think also, and, and this relates back to the point that, that Jeremy made about having an OBR for oversight, we have some fantastic bodies in this country that, that give oversight. Uh, I think Audit Scotland does a, a really, really good first-class job. Um, what I think we do need to have is we need to have more of that in different areas. Um, there is about to be a huge change uh, over the next few years in what the Parliament does, how it does it, and how it affects the lives of individual people up and down this country. And we need to make sure that, you know, people like me aren't doing it with impunity. Who watches the watchers? And we need to be watched. Okay. Yes. <coughs> A slight change in tack. Alan Brown. Concerning the election coming in May, and mm. particularly the Gordon constituency in Aberdeenshire, <laughs> if all the no referendum voters in September, which was 60%, vote against the SNP candidate, he won't get in. What's your view on tactical voting? Okay. Um, I'm... Here's a news line, if ever there was, and a bear trap for me to step into. Um, I think I'll, I'll restrict my answer to, to the Gordon constituency, if I may, because that's the one that you particularly talked about, rather than across the whole country. Um, first of all, the 60% the plus vote was for Aberdeenshire, uh, the local authority area. It wasn't for the Gordon constituency. Um, so we need to look at, at uh, um, areas on the ground. Um, secondly, there's about to be a whole slew of... Uh, polls that come out for individual constituencies uh, across the country. We, we have national polls. There was one today by STV that showed the SNP polling 52% across the country. Um, national polls must have more than 1,001 people interviewed in order to be regarded as stati statistically significant. Uh, so that's 1,001 people plus across the whole of the UK. I think this one was 1,002 or 1,004. To do the same in individual constituencies means that you need over a thousand in each of the individual constituencies. Um, like I say, Lord Ashcroft has already done the field work for that. They're um, being weighted as we speak and they're going to be published uh, in the next few weeks. Um, I would be astonished uh, if it so proved that tactical voting would have any material effect on the result in Gordon. I think there's a reason why the Gordon constituency was chosen for the former First Minister to stand in. And that is the most political answer I think I can give. <laughs> that keeps me out of trouble and out of the newspapers. So there you go. Um, and yes, please. Here we go. Ruth uh, Gordon Cairns, mm -hmm. ex-Buckhaven High School. 
Good man. Perseverando. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> We're tutti et opera. And to be a conservative <laughs> at Buckhaven, you must have had courage. Uh, I'm tough. Yeah. Also, uh, the first in the family uh, to go to university. Um, and I've seen over my working lifetime a move towards meritocracy. And I'm a headhunter. So I see it every day, basically, and the people that come before me to be interviewed, that they're getting there on merit. I see a slip back now, where people are pro promoting people on the basis of contacts rather than merit, and I'd just like to understand how you would try to reverse that trend. Well, I'm sad to hear that you're, you're seeing a, a slip back on that. I genuinely am, because I don't think that that's the country we either should have we've had in the past, nor do we want in this country. Um, the idea that Scotland has always had of that we welcome everyone, we're all Jock Tamsons Bairns, we try and promote people, and it's, you know, the, the whole I can't your feather, it's, it's not about, you know, who you know, it's about what you can do. Um, but what you can do doesn't exist in a vacuum, and that's why I've talked so much tonight and why I've talked in previous times about things like school reform. Because we see, and we have seen, that people that come from the poorer quintiles of our society don't do as well at school. And that's not because they're not as bright, but it's because of a lot of social factors that need addressed. It's also because, I believe, um, they're not having the same abilities to be stretched at school. Um, I think that there are examples around the world, in fact, we don't have to look very far for them, where we've seen that having changes to the way in which you teach someone, getting away from this one-size-fits-all category can have remarkable effects. You look at uh, the Selly Oak Academies down in Birmingham, where more than half the people are on free school meals, but have gone on to get five good GCSEs, coming from a starting position that was far below that. Um, you look at, like I say, you look at different ways of teaching people. You look at how you sort of add merit and grade to a society. Um, I think something like the technical schools in Japan that I, I briefly mentioned are something that we should look at here. I know that JCB have an academy uh, down south, but why is it and, and why did we allow it to become the case where, yes, we wanted 50% of people to go to university, that's great, but there was something lesser about the other 50% who didn't. The idea that going into a trade, that going straight from school to an apprenticeship and learning on a job was somehow less, that going into further education rather than higher education was somehow less. Um, I spent a lot of time um, in the last four years uh, since I was elected to the Scottish Parliament looking at, at some of the work that's being done by our further education colleges around this country. And some of it is absolutely superb. And I think not too far from where we grew up, I think of uh, Carnegie College as it, as it was and its campus at Resyth and the work that it's doing which was originally engineering work to do with shipbuilding and because it had a, 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 sh a ship site next door to it and, and right on the site that is now converting into um, deep sea exploration and oil rig servicing because it's the same skills. The jobs that these guys and girls are going on to get up in Aberdeenshire and they're being headhunted, you know, earns far in excess of what a lowly backbencher like I earn, and rightly so, because it has a level of skills that I can only aspire to. You know, and, it, and it's about, uh, it, it's also part of the economy of this country. So I think that when it comes to letting people reach the potential that they have, it starts in early years education, it starts in making sure that we have access to the soft skills that, that preschool children need so that they have socialization with other youngsters, that they have the language skills, that they have the um, dexterity skills that they need when they go to school. But it also means that from school age, we have the ability that each child can reach their full potential. And I don't believe that that is currently being served by a comprehensive system. And I don't say that as a dogma. I say that by looking at the results that we have in international league tables. There's something called the, the PISA results, which every year, uh, sorry, every second year, um, tests people in OECD countries around the world in three disciplines, one in reading, one in maths, and one in science. You know, Scotland is not zooming up those tables. Um, we are holding steady in a couple and going down in one. You know, we should have the ability to compete against other countries in the world. They're zooming ahead and we're staying behind. Conversely, 
Um, again, I don't want this, this to be an England versus Scotland argument, but down south, we're seeing that even though they started from behind us, we used to have a better education than, than system than them, um, the results down south are going up and up and up in each of the three disciplines. You know, I think that should be sending a warning flag to us. I think that should be saying to us that, look, let's not be complacent about the system that we have. Let's not say that there is nothing that we can learn from other countries around the world. So I'm sorry you wanted short no. questions, but I've just given an enormously long answer. Uh, enormously long. Questions can be short. I, 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 am, I am aware of that. But, um, you know, there isn't a trite one-sentence answer to how we make sure that some kid from Pilton or Buckhaven, like, like you and I, can make it to the top of whichever tree we want to get to. Um, but there are complex reasons why many people from that background don't, when others who have more, perhaps, fiscal, financial, or family advantages but less talent do. And that is something that we all have to address, not just for the individuals, but for the, the wealth, the happiness, the progress of our nation. Okay, thank you. And um, down here. Thank you very much. Tim Burrows from ICAS. Um, just a question on coalition politics. With coalition becoming seemingly more common, um, is the day of a party issuing a manifesto with specific pledges that they can't perhaps keep when they go into coalition government gone? And is there a case for setting out a vision and a set of principles rather than something specific that can't actually be delivered? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure that I necessarily accept the premise of it. I, I think if you look at UK politics, we've had our first coalition government in 60 years. Um, at the moment, the polls indicate that there may not be a, a majority government uh, thereafter. Um, I think in Scotland, we've shown the way that you can have a minority government that works. And I don't see that that's something that we can't uh, export to, to a UK-wide uh, audience. I think if you look at the way in which um, the Welsh Assembly has worked. You've, you've seen other forms and models of government too that aren't coalitions. And I think if you look at the Scottish Parliament, there's been a move away from coalition government rather than for it, uh, in the, certainly in the, in the last election. But I, th I think manifestos are important. I think that you do have to set a list of outcomes that you want to achieve that you can be measured against. And I use the word outcomes... Um, on purpose because I think, um, and this was particularly true um, under the Blair government, less so under Brown, but under the Blair government, there was a real focus on inputs. So how much money did you spend on something? So you looked at what you were inputting. You didn't look at the output and you didn't look at the outcome. Um, and I think that... Um, We've all learned from that, and I think actually the Labour Party has learned from that too. Uh, and I think that you do have to um, set a proper, tangible list of outcomes that you want to achieve and your way in which you are going to go and do that um, so that you can be held to account. One there and one up there, please. Uh, my name is Neil McLean, and I work for the Scotland office. I was quite closely involved in the referendum. Ruth, it's, it struck me that in the course of that referendum, there were many that wanted to paint uh, the sort of Tories almost as a, as a dirty word uh, in Scottish it politics. It stops. No, well, but that, that's my question, because um, it was almost to the extent that if you voted one way, it was a way to ensure that Scotland would never have a Tory government again. I mean, half a million people uh, voted Conservative in the last election, and it can hardly be the case that democracy would be better served if a situation was engineered that reduced choice. Do you, do you think you need to do a better job of pushing back against this sort of lazy politics? Um, yes, I do. And that is part of my job as leader of my party. Um, I think it's not a new phenomenon. Um, I think that after the 1997 wipeout, um, the party looked to itself and contemplated its navel a little bit. It allowed others to write our history for us. And I'll, I'll give you an, an example of that. My first foray into attempted elected politics was the 2009 Glasgow North East by-election when Michael Martin, the Speaker of the House of Commons, left after all of the expenses. I think I was the, I was the Conservative candidate there. And I was on doorsteps in Springburn and Milton and Burmulloch, if any of you know these highly desirable and uh, aesthetically pleasing areas of Glasgow. And um, had people telling me that, you know, they wouldn't vote Tory because Thatcher shut their, their rail yards at Cowlairs and St Rollocks that were in the constituency. 
Um, and I did have to point out to them that the rail yards had shot. Um, they'd shot in the 60s um, because they had been making steam locomotives and the world had moved on to diesel. And that while I'm, I'm no political historian, um, I know that that was long before the time Margaret Thatcher was in government. I think it may have been the time the time before she was even in Parliament and was still an industrial chemist making the secret ingredient for Mr Whippy ice cream. But the myth had grown up that the Tories had shot their rail yards and therefore it had grain credence. And, and we've, we've never pushed back against some of, the, or we haven't in our recent past, pushed back against some of the myths that other people have written for us. And I think too, there's also been a little bit of sackcloth and ashes. I think um, when, I was, when I was running for leader of the, the party, um, I made the point that we'd been clearing our throat a bit and been a bit apologetic. We used to go up to people and say, I'm sorry I'm conservative, but this is what I believe. Um, and that's what we'd ask our activists to do. And actually what we should be doing is saying, I believe X, Y, and Z. And if you believe that, then you're a conservative too. Uh, come with us and let's have that conversation. And, and one of the, the real eye-openers for me during the referendum campaign uh, is... I set up an organisation called Conservative Friends of the Union and I wrote to lots of people across Scotland and said, um, we know you're not a Conservative, you're not a Conservative member, you're not a member of the party, you've never been involved, um, but we're fighting this referendum campaign. Uh, I set this up in 2012. We're fighting this referendum campaign. It's incredibly important. Will you stand with us and help us as we fight it on the side of the no campaign to keep our country together? And more than 80,000 people wrote back and said yes. And over the period, I've been having a conversation with these people, I've been writing out to them, I've asked them to get involved, I've had them delivering leaflets up and down the country, I've had them knocking on doors, I've had them coming to events. And after the referendum was over, I, I held a, a string of kind of town hall meetings around the country um, to say thank you to them for standing with us uh, on this very important issue. Uh, and said, look, my personal belief is that the referendum um, result is a case of us having won the war, but we haven't won the peace. You know, it's it's a battle one, but I don't think it's over yet. I think there's a lot of work to do, uh, and that the, if you believe the SNP and separatism is a danger, that the danger is no less on the, the 19th of September than it was on the 17th. Will you please stand with us again and, and, and as we fight the next general election? Uh, and thousands of them have, and that's hugely encouraging to me because uh, as a political party, you need other people to make your arguments for you. It's not just the people that are elected to a parliament. It's not just the people who are elected to uh, the council chamber, but it's individuals up and down the country. It's the people in the, the, you know, the flower club at the church. It's the people that do the amateur dramatics uh, in their local town hall. It's the people that play football in their local five or seven asides team that have to go out and make the argument because... There is a sense that other people have, have, have tried to set the Conservative Party up as something other to ordinary Scots. Whether they try to set us up as, as English, I don't know if I sound English to anyone here, I'm not. Set us up as posh, I don't know if I sound posh to anyone here, I'm really not. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know if somebody that's uh, old or out of touch or all of these other characterisations that are put onto the party. We have to demonstrate that actually we are a pluralistic party across the whole of Scotland that look and sound like everybody else and are making legitimate arguments which you can agree with or disagree with, but let's have the debate. We're making legitimate arguments about the future of this country and how it should be run. And you're right, you know, more than 412,000 people backed us in 2010, and I can envisage that going up in 2015. There will be half a million people or more who vote Conservative. That is a significant cohort of our country. Um, and we shouldn't be ignored or sidelined, and it's my job to make sure that we're not. Thank you, Ruth. An interesting session. My name is Bill Howitt, retired public servant and chair of a charity in Edinburgh that helps uh, disadvantaged people into employment. And with, uh, if the chair doesn't mind, I would like to make two points. Uh, the first one is a retired public short. servant. Thank you. I was uh, delighted to hear you talk about outcomes in response to the question about manifestos. Can I ask you then to reflect on the earlier question you had about 3,000 extra nurses? and a thousand extra police that your party, I recall, a few years ago made part of the bargaining for the budget. These are inputs. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that your response to that will be that you're going to move back to, the, move to the position that Christy recommended. In terms of my charity, I'm delighted to hear you say that you want to give greater uh, power to the individual. 
The individuals that we represent are clearly not in a strong position. They are disadvantaged. We are in a very difficult situation because uh, the DWP reforms mean that we have to find them a job, a job, whatever that might be. Many of them are never going to get a job that doesn't have some kind of support to it. So how are you going to refine your aim to listen to the individual? Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that, Bill. Yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of, of outcomes. The outcome that we wanted to see, and a 1,000 extra nurses, sorry, not 3,000, uh, is a, a kind of shorthand for that. The outcome that we wanted to see uh, was that the £60 million that is currently um, spent on free prescriptions in Scotland every year would be put back into frontline services. Uh, and the way in which we, because we believe that the staffing ratio per bed has gone down uh, in Scotland, and that we have seen a detriment to patient care and that the patient care is, is the outcome there. So it's making sure that the patient care uh, and the, the hospital experience uh, and uh, ability and, and uh, ability to get people out of hospital is, is the kind of outcome we're looking at is best served by having uh, a higher number of health professionals working on the front line caring for the patient. Um, it is constrained by the money that's there, but we're using the majority of that money that we can uh, to do that, and that's about the ratio that it is. Um, the reason that we believe that uh, the patient care uh, has, has changed was because the number of nurses and midwives had fallen in Scotland. And we looked at outcomes of uh, the outcomes of the number of uh, pregnant women who were released from hospital uh, within 24 hours of having their baby uh, and lots of other outcomes as well. So it's, it's, it's a, a good shorthand to put on a pledge card, but you're absolutely right, it is driven by the outcome uh, of patient care. On the DWP reforms, um, I fully accept that there is no perfect solution for getting people who are far from the jobs market back into a job. One of the changes that the DWP made uh, as part of their reforms, uh, I think rightly, um, and I think I'm quite happy to concede that it, it needs refinement, but it was to recognise that there are people who need extra help from charities such as yourself, from other uh, work-finding organisations, um, and that they need to be paid more, if you like, for, for shorthand, uh, to help people who've got more complex needs to get back into the jobs market. And that's why instead of uh, the way it used to work, where it was how many people you got back in, you got the X amount of money, uh, you get more for people who are much further from the jobs market um, to make sure that uh, organisations don't just tackle the low-hanging fruit. And I think the charitable sector is important in this, and, and I've, I've done uh, some work, uh, limited work, um, because this is UK, this is a, a Westminster issue, but in terms of my own patch in, in Glasgow and in Scotland, I've done some limited work uh, with charities who help people in specific sectors. Um, you know, the job centre in the old days wasn't the best people, the best service, to try and help people who had, for example, a specific disability back into work. However, some organisations, charitable or third sector organisations, who help in disabled the disabled sphere are much better <coughs> at helping their already existing client group back into work, and they're being supported by the DWP uh, in order to expand their portfolio of what they did. So rather than support, they're also now getting people back into work, which is an added string to their bow. Now, I fully accept that DWP reforms aren't there yet. I think they are an improvement on what went before, but I'm not satisfied that we can't keep improving. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Smith, now we must win the peace. I think I possibly was the first person to use that in my we woman persona. I wrote the uh, We Women Looks at the Referendum. The peace is not won by appeasement. There are a very large number of Scots just now who fear that what has happened post-referendum has been appeasement. But there is a much more fundamental issue, which is the security of sterling under a union which is now devolving so much fiscal and other financial authorities to a subsidiary nation 
that we could end up with a Eurozone-style crisis. Now, can you tell me how the combination of Holyrood and Westminster will ensure that the appeasement as it appears turns out to be continued strength of sterling for the entire United Kingdom, while at the same time bringing together those parties, those persons, those families, and those former friends who have indeed been split apart during this last year? Okay, there's, there's a lot of ground there, but if, if I could start with the, the appeasement point, I, I actually reject that. I don't believe that it is appeasement, and I'll explain um, where I think we are and, and where I think we've come from. Um, I don't think that despite the, the, the big brains that were there and, and the best intentions in the world, it was ever conceivable that the people who created the Scottish Parliament after the referendum in 97 in 1999 would get everything right first time. I think one of the things that wasn't right was you had a situation uh, where you had a Scottish Parliament that was in charge of tens of millions of pounds of public spending, but wasn't in charge of raising very much or, or indeed uh, almost any of that money. Um, I think what that has allowed to do, if we fast forward to the, the referendum campaign, it has allowed a nationalist party in government to spend its time in government spending seven years going around the country of Scotland saying everything good in this country is because we spent money on it and everything bad is because that nasty George Osborne wouldn't give us enough. And I think lots of people in this country bought that argument. I do not believe for one second that it is appeasement to stop giving future first ministers, future finance ministers a free pass on the decisions that they make. If they're going to want to commit money to projects, absolutely right and proper, but they're going to have to look the taxpayer in the eye when they open their palm and say, hand over your cash so that I can do this. Um, and the reason that I say that um, is because I think there, there has been a, a real sense of trying to drive that wedge. There has been a real sense of um, you can get things um, without paying for them. And the example that I would use is if a streetlight goes out in your street, you pick up the phone and you phone the council. Why? Because you pay your council tax. Now, your council tax is actually only a tiny proportion of what a council takes in. But because you physically pay it, because you have a bill, because it comes through your door, because it comes out of your bank account, you feel that you have ownership and the right to tell the council that they need to fix that streetlight. And I think that's right and proper. So people know that they pay councils. People know that they pay their income tax to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And they feel that they are uh, able to um, you know, have conversations and discussions and criticisms about how that money is used. Actually, nobody <coughs> thinks that the Scottish Parliament, nobody picks up the phone to the Scottish Parliament and says, what are you doing with my money? Because they don't see the money coming out of their back pocket and going to Butte House. And that's what I think is going to change in future. When you see the right-hand side of your paycheck going straight into the back pocket of, you know, St Andrew's House to be distributed, then actually the level of scrutiny by individuals of the Scottish Government, I think, will go up. And I don't believe that that is appeasement. On the second point, the security of Stirling. Um, we worked very hard in the Smith Commission to take on board uh, the views of different stakeholders, including uh, the business community and others. That's why you see, for example, um, corporation tax has been retained at a UK level. That's why you see that the single market has been retained at a UK level. That's why you see the single regulatory regime, for example, in financial services has been maintained and, re and retained at a UK level. Um, I also think if you look at the money markets, if you look at what has happened to sterling post-September, um, post October when the, the Smith Commission was, sorry, post November when the Smith Commission came out, you haven't seen any movement there. Um, what's involved in the Smith Commission um, still allows for a strong macroeconomic framework that's controlled at Westminster and benefits the whole of the UK as befitting a G7 big economy in the world. We haven't spooked the money markets. What we are doing is uh, creating greater um, ability within Scotland 
to raise and pay for some of the services that we have in Scotland. And income tax is one of the ways in which we've done it. Thank you. So I'm going to take the last couple of questions now. I think there was one over here and um, one over there, which seems to have disappeared. But we'll, take the, we'll begin with this one. Thank you. After the referendum, the Labour Party in Scotland spent quite a lot of effort seeking greater autonomy from London. Mm. Do you have less or more autonomy uh, from London than the Scottish Labour Party? And will you then be leading the Scottish Conservative campaign in the Westminster election? Okay. Um, really easy answer to that, yes. Um, we did a, a big investigation after the 2010 general election. For those of you who are politically um, even more of an anorak than I am, it was called the Sanderson Commission. It was under the remit of Lord Sanderson of Bowdoin. Um, and we looked at the idea that uh, our leader in Scotland, Annabel Goldie, David McCletchie before her, was actually really only the leader of the MSP group in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and our unelected chairman was in charge of areas such as uh, finance, uh, candidates, campaigns, all of that sort of area. Um, and we realised that that didn't really wash. Uh, Organisations need a single head um, where the buck stops. So we changed that, and we changed that at a, uh, you know, before the, the Scottish parliamentary election in, in 2011. So I am the first leader of the Scottish Conservatives rather than leader of the Conservative group in the Scottish Parliament, which is what the others were known as. So um, in comparison with Labour, if, if I give you an example, um, I don't know if any of you remember the brouhaha over the candidate that was elected in Falkirk that had to resign and there was all this stuff about unions and all the rest of it. And it became apparent um, during all of that campaign that Joanne Lamont didn't actually have any power to tell the candidate to NAFO and to say we're going to have another, uh, we're going to have a, a, another candidate selection or anything like that. You know, that doesn't happen to me. I'm in charge of everything. If we fail, it's because of me, and I get the blame. If we succeed, then it's because of our wonderful activists. But in terms of uh, <laughs> always, um, but you know, in terms of being in charge of budgets, of staffing, of activists, of candidates, of policy, of um, you know, of. You know, David Mundell as our MP, um, uh, Ian Duncan as our MEP, of over 100 councillors up and down the country. All of that is my remit in a way that the Labour Party just haven't had. Joanne was the leader of the group in the Scottish Parliament. And, and that's the difference between us. OK, thank Ruth, I'm going to claim uh, Chair's privilege. And just um, before we close, just ask a question that goes back to um, the issue of outcomes mm -hmm. and manifestos. And some of the things that you set out in your vision in terms of responding to the needs of ageing populations, education, the policy um, issues relating to that, all of which have of course, require considerable inputs in terms of resources and potentially increasing inputs uh, in terms of, of resources. And I, I wonder whether um, a lot of the manifesto commitments and statements actually overpromise in terms of what actually can be delivered within the resources that are available to governments in a society which is reluctant to see its tax increased. You, you referred to the 7% um, of Scots who uh, would, would favour tax increases. And just attached to that, though, um, you also talked about um, people being willing to pay more for prescriptions if they can afford it. And that actually sits at, at odds with people not wanting to um, increase their contribution, if I could put it that way. Is, is it perhaps that people don't trust that increases in taxes will go to the purposes or the things that politicians promise they will deliver. Um, but if they can see that what they do pay, such as 
prescription charges, which will deliver X number of nurses, improved healthcare, and so on, they're much more willing to put their hands in their pockets for that. So I just... Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you for leading by example on the brief question front. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, but no, actually, I think the broad point that you make is absolutely true. I, I think that um, where there isn't transparency on how money is spent, there is a natural and quite right suspicion. Um, and I think that small measures uh, have improved uh, the way in, in which uh, we do that. For example, uh, the current Chancellor has um, set out that future uh, sort of P60s at your end of the tax year will have at the bottom of it uh, a sort of pie chart that shows you what proportion of the tax that you spend, how much of your money has been spent on defence, how much has been spent on pensions, how much has been spent on welfare, so that people who are, you know, physically handing over cash that they have gone out and from the sweat of their brow earned, they know how much that is, how much is spent on foreign aid, for example. Um, because we have found when we, we've looked at this that people think that, I think foreign aid is a really good one, people think that that's a massive, massive contribution that, that comes out of their back pocket to people that live in other countries, when actually it's 0.07% uh, of GDP. Um, so I think you're right, and I think that, as I said and briefly alluded to in my speech, given that we are now a sort of big data society and, and people, should they so wish, can go and find out more, I think there's no excuse for governments not to put that sort of information uh, freely and widely available, um, not just for consumers to come to, but to actually physically send it out to them. And I, and I applaud uh, any moves that include that, that improve that transparency. I think uh, George Osborne's right to shove it in the bottom of your, your tax return at the end of the year. But I, um, I don't wonder if there's there's more and more inventive ways in which we can do it so that people feel that they have a stake in the government of their country uh, and they feel that they um, know what they're contributing to and how that contribution uh, is used. Okay, well, um, can I thank you very much for that and uh, to the audience as well for keeping their question short, even if I didn't. Um, and I think that we've heard uh, a very, as I said, cogent exposition of uh, the Conservative uh, vision for a future Scotland, particularly as we move into a very important year, two years uh, ahead. But on that note, can I hand over to Ray just to close proceedings? Thank you very much, Joni. Just my pleasant duty to thank Ruth uh, very much for her very thoughtful speech and for answering the question so thoroughly, uh, and Joan Stringer for um, chairing the debate so ably. Um, can I just remind you that our next event is on the 5th of February with Patrick Harvey, leader of the Green Party in Scotland, uh, and invite you to continue the conversation in the foyer where we'll be happy to provide you with a drink. Thank you very much indeed.